Californians, that is all seniors, and we plan general May commencement as well as senior week. So last lecture is actually the second event this week. We're also having a movie screening, pub night, we're painting the big C, and there will be a masquerade ball on Sunday. So if you haven't heard about it already, please like the class of 2014 Senior Class Council on Facebook. So I'm going to pass it on to Dennis right now, who's Vice President of the Californians, and he's going to talk to you a bit more about last lecture and how we came to choose Robert Reich as a professor this year. So first things first, uh, I'm going to take a picture of a full capacity house for Robert Reich. So if everyone just wants to uh, throw up a pose. So a little bit more about last lecture. So what last lecture is, is that our committee uh, selects professors on campus that are well-loved and well-received. And what we do is we invite them to give a send-off lecture to the class of 2014, all of you guys sitting here, uh, just sharing some nuggets of wisdom and life experiences that they would like to impart upon all of us. So this year, we have uh, with us Professor Robert Reich. Robert Reich sorry. <laughs> Uh, he's currently here uh, as a professor of public policy. Uh, many of you guys know him from his Wealth and Poverty class. He was also former Secretary of Labor for President Bill Clinton. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Robert Reich. Well, thank you, Dennis. You guys are graduating. <laughs> well, I have, a lot to, I have a lot to say, and a lot of advice to give, and a lot of, uh, just a lot of content. Uh, but this, let me just say, there's a little bit of bait and switch operating here, because this is not my last lecture. <laughs> and for most of you, this is not even your last lecture. So why are we calling it the last lecture? Uh, this is a lecture, but it's not even a lecture. I mean, I am going to say things here that I probably, that I doubt that I would say in the classroom. But this is not a classroom, right? So I'm free to say whatever I want to say. And when, don't misunderstand me. I am free to say what I want to say in the classroom, but I have certain constraints that I impose on myself. And those constraints that I impose on myself are that I don't want to, in any way, uh, sway somebody's views simply because they happen to be my views, either for or against my views. Uh, but here, I mean, it's almost the last lecture. <laughs> and it's not even a classroom. So I can open up, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, let me say, uh, for, here's what I was planning to do. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, jobs. out of the way. I know a lot about jobs. I know what kind of job market you're going to enter into, and so I'm, I need to talk about jobs, all right? For a while, it won't be painful. It'll be just, you know, I'll just talk about them. <laughs> uh, and then I want to go on and talk a little bit about leadership and courage uh, in terms of the kinds of larger questions that are going to be facing our society and the world, and what you hopefully are going to do about all of this. Okay? And then I might say anything else. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Uh, and then, oh, and this, the, I, I don't plan to talk for more than maybe uh, 35 or 40 minutes. I don't want to. But I would like to have a, an opportunity to answer any questions you have. Is that all right with you? Okay. So we'll, we'll, right now it's 7.30, uh, and we will finish all of it by 8.30. Is that our social contract? All right? Okay? Everybody on board? Uh, okay, first of all, on jobs. Uh, this is, I don't know how many of you are going directly into the job market, and how many of you are going on to graduate school or professional school, uh, or how many of you, I don't know what your plans are, and I, and I, and I can only imagine. I, I just want to warn, the, the good news is that the job market is not nearly as bad as it was last year or the year before. It's getting better. 
Uh, the other piece of good news is you are going to be a graduate of one of the best universities in the world. If not the best, in fact, the best public university in the world. You will... No, I'm not, I'm not saying that to pander, I mean it. Uh, but so you are, you are, the good news is it's a better job market and you have extraordinary credentials. Uh, even if you don't deserve them, you have them. <laughs> And employers won't know. <laughs> I mean, they may find out, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> so you're, you're in very, very good shape. I, but, but here's the thing that I, I, I want to warn you about. Uh, one thing I want to warn you about is that your job, uh, even if next year is not your first job or next month is not your first job, uh, your first job is probably going to be a kind of job where you feel overqualified. You're wrong, but you're going to feel no more. <laughs> now you're going to feel, uh, my first job, uh, and, and I graduated in a pretty pretty good job market, my first job uh, was, I wanted to, I, you know, I, I'm embarrassed to say this because you've seen the series Mad Men, have you seen the series? Yeah. Well, I got a job on Madison Avenue in New York in a little tiny advertising agency. Not that I really wanted to stay there, I was not going to stay there, but I just wanted some experience. And I was interested in issues of, of advertising and marketing and sales. And I wanted to understand the economy from the inside rather than just study it from outside. And I thought, what better place to understand the economy from the inside than a little uh, advertising agency? I mean, that's sort of the heart of the American economy in a way. Uh, and, uh, but, and I got a job, uh, but I discovered that the job was a gopher job. You know what a gopher job is? Go for this, go for that, go for coffee, go for... So I was not getting very much experience, but even worse, even worse, the job after two months of this, I was in charge of the boss's German Shepherd. Now this is a big dog. But what it, in, what it entailed, being in charge of the boss's German Shepherd, was having a pooper scooper. <laughs> now, I had graduated college, and I was very proud of the fact I graduated college. But it was a very, uh, I started work, uh, it was a very hot summer, and I, and we were on the 42nd floor of this particular little ad agency on Madison Avenue, and there was a little porch outside the boss's office. Uh, and the porch, although it did have a kind of a, you know, kind of a, a fence around it, it was not unsafe, uh, but it had tar paper, uh, it was just sort of tar paper. And the tar paper got very, very soft and gooey. And the boss's dog, <laughs> the boss's dog uh, did his business outside on the tar paper, and my job was in about 95 degree heat with this soft, gooey tar paper trying to scrape. Well, I don't need to get into details. <laughs> I just want to tell you that I didn't, I felt personally over overqualified. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought that I had a pretty good degree and I just didn't think that I was being fully, my capacities were not being tested. Uh, and. I guess the, the logic or the moral of that is that there is a certain degree of pride that you may have to swallow a bit in terms of your first job. Now I'm just saying this, maybe not, maybe you're going to be, you know, you'll, you're, you're just going to be given an extraordinary responsibilities, but I'm warning you, there is a, a little bit, you need a little bit of capacity for humiliation. <laughs> and, and you do as well. Well, you're going to do well. Uh, just begin, I'm talking about the beginning of the job market. The other thing that you need to know is that not all bosses uh, or people who are in charge of you are going to be terribly concerned about your well-being. Now that also was a little bit of a surprise to me. I, I don't think it may not be a surprise to you, uh, but it was a surprise to me because I, you know, I came from a, a college where there were uh, people around who seemed to be, uh, you know, adults seemed to be concerned about me, more or less, not 
wasn't a, a, a personal, 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 but you know, more or less concerned, and I had parents who were concerned, and I, and I kind of had an image in my head of a boss who was a cross between a professor and a parent, but I was wrong. Uh, the boss didn't really care at all. In fact, if it was possible to be a negative care, <laughs> uh, I, you know, here, this is, a, this is an important point, though, this is important. Because I had just, I had had a summer internship the year before in Robert F. Kennedy's Senate office. Now this was a very, you know, can you imagine how heady it was to be in Robert F. Kennedy's Senate office as a summer, summer intern, intern. So I kind of expected that my next job would have even more uh, excitement about it. Now in Robert Kennedy's Senate office, I was not, I want you to understand, given huge responsibilities. My responsibility was to run Robert F. Kennedy, Senator Robert F. Kennedy's signature machine. <laughs> now by that, I simply mean that my job was to take all of the letters that his secretaries had written that day and put them into a machine where there was a pen on the end of a long wooden arm and to line it up exactly properly so the wooden arm and the pen would write Robert F. Kennedy. And I did that, you know, usually about 1,500 every two or three hours for months. <laughs> Until I got so bored that I started to, at night, I'd sneak in and I'd use his stationery and I'd write letters to my friends. <laughs> Dear, from, you know, on his stationery, dear Mr. Dworkin, congratulations on having the largest nose in New York City, Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, in fact, that, that person, uh, Mr. Dworkin, Douglas Dworkin, he still, he, he, about three weeks ago, I was in New York visiting, and he brought out a letter framed from my uh, But one day, uh, about two months into this internship, and I'm talking about job preparation here, one, one day, two months into the internship, uh, I uh, was standing in front of elevator banks uh, at the Senate office building, and out came Robert Kennedy, Senator Robert F. Kennedy. And I had not really even met him. I mean, I, I barely met him. I, I think I, I was roughly introduced to him along with a couple of other interns. But he actually, and I was, I was almost frozen with excitement and, you know, and awe. And he came out of the elevator bank and he, and he, and he was surrounded by aides who were uh, talking very, very high level public policy discussions with him in both ears. And he saw me and he looked at me and he said, how are you doing, Bob? <laughs> Bob. He knew my name. <laughs> Me, Bob. <laughs> and I was so floored that I couldn't even get out a response. I went, ah. ah. <laughs> but I would have worked for him and that signature machine for the next six months on the basis of just that little tiny courtesy, that little tiny understanding and, and sense that I was a person. Uh, which also is a lesson about jobs and work. And that lesson is to go out of your way to understand and appreciate the dignity of everyone working around you. Because I think too often in the workplace, whether it's a not-for-profit or a for-profit or a government, we don't appreciate and respect the dignity of the people around us. Uh, the other thing that I want to suggest to you is that you never know uh, about luck. There's always a quality of luck. We, we tend to think that our jobs and our careers have a lot to do with merit, uh, and we tend to downplay how much they have to do with luck. I, I was an undergraduate, by the way, when I went out uh, with, on a, like, I guess you, you must call it a date, with an undergraduate from another college named Hillary Rodden. 
Now, <laughs> she subsequently began, went on to become President of the United States in 2016. <laughs> So I will be able to say I dated a president. <laughs> Think about that. No, I, I, it was not, I mean, it was not, it, it was not a formal date. I, she was president of her freshman class at Wellesley, and I was president of my sophomore class at Dartmouth. And we saw each other, and, and we arranged for a presidential summit. <laughs> and the only reason I remember this, and I, I actually did not remember it until in the 2008 presidential election, uh, and some of you may have heard me mention this because it came to me. Uh, there was a reporter from the New York Times who called me and said that he had found a whole set of her letters from her undergraduate days at Wellesley. And in the letter, she makes some reference to going out on a date with me. And the reporter, and I had no memory, and the reporter said, what can you tell me about that date that, that might shed light on how she would perform as a president? <laughs> No, I, 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 seriously. And I, I thought he was joking. And so, I, first of all, I didn't want to say I don't remember the date. That would not be good form, would it? So I, I, so I said, uh, well, I, all I remember is that she wanted an extraordinary amount of butter on her popcorn. <laughs> There was silence. And I said, um, I said, I'm, I'm sorry, are you still there? And he said, yes, I'm just writing this down. Well, so much for the state of the media and the press. Uh, but when I say luck, I mean that I, I, I you know, it sort of just, I, it was just why, you know, I only had four dates when I was an undergraduate, and one of them happened to be Hillary Rodham. Uh, and I met also, and it was completely coincidence, I got a, a Rhodes Scholarship. That, by the way, was pure, unadulterated luck. <laughs> luck. Because you're supposed to be an athlete to be a Rhodes Scholar. And I was anything but an athlete. <laughs> uh, and so I had no chance at all, but I got it. And then, uh, then we went over to England on a boat. In those days, we went on a boat. And <laughs> And those, and the, no, there were, there were planes. There were. <laughs> no, I must look to you to be very, very old. I'm not that old. I really am not. Spiritually, I'm very young. I look old, but I'm not old. But in those days, there were planes, and they would, they, but we didn't take a plane. The tradition was to take a boat. So we all took a boat together. Uh, and I got very seasick, and uh, there was a knock on my door about halfway across the Atlantic. I thought I was going to die of seasickness. Uh, and there, I opened the door, and there was a, a tall, gangly southerner uh, from, from Arkansas. Uh, and he said, he had chicken soup in one hand, and he had crackers in the other. He said, hi, I, I hear you haven't been feeling well. My name is, my name is Bill Clinton. And I... <laughs> Well, yes, you, you say, ah, oh, was, it was nice of him at that particular moment. <laughs> at that particular moment, my, my, I looked at the chicken soup, and my first impulse, now again, I, my first impulse was to vomit. <laughs> and then I thought, I will have to control this, because he's really being very sweet. Uh, but I did not let him in. But, here's the point, uh, we became friends, and then uh, when we went to law school, the first day of law school, uh, this girl, Hillary Rodham, who I had dated in a way, <laughs> came up uh, to me and she said, Bob, how are you? And I said, Hillary, I'm just great. Listen, I want you to meet my friend who was sitting next to me, a uh, Bill. A uh, Bill, this is Hillary. Bill, hello, Hillary, this is Bill. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> about how all of this is, I mean, it really is not in your control. And, and, and I could go on and on, but I, I just want you to know that these lessons about humility and also the dignity of work and also luck 
uh, are very profound. I mean, they, they sound not profound. In fact, even as I say them, they sound very superficial. But they are actually true. The other thing that's true, and I saved it for last, is you are going to fail. You think that's funny? <laughs> You're going to fail. You're going to fail big. I kept, I mean, the, the issue is not succeeding or failing. I kept on failing. I mean, I got, I got, uh, you know, you know when you're, when you're fired, that very few people actually come and say you're fired. Uh, the usual, at least in professional jobs, what they say is, are you sure you're happy here? <laughs> or uh, do you think that this is the right job for you? Or something like that. Anyway, I was, at that particular time, I was working for Robert Bork. I don't know how many of you remember Robert Bork. Maybe he was before your time. He was Solicitor General of the United States. Uh, he was subsequently nominated to be a Supreme Court Justice. He didn't make it. Uh, he is, uh, was, he's no longer with us, a uh, conservative Republican. And I took the job with Bork because uh, he offered it to me, and it was assistant to the Solicitor General, overwhelmed with the title, assistant to the Solicitor General. And I was so overwhelmed with the kind of, you know, what looked like uh, and sounded like a very important job, that I took it without really examining whether I would like it. And I didn't like it. And we, uh, Robert Bork and I, we disagreed on a lot. I mean, like the first, second, uh, Fourth, fifth, and eighth and amendments to the Constitution, <laughs> for example. Uh, and so I did very badly, and I, I, and somebody, the deputy, his deputy, came to my office one day and said, uh, "Are you, do you, are you enjoying what you're doing? Do you think you like, what, uh, do you think you'd like to do something else?" And I, in a very sophisticated way, I knew that meant you're fired. Now the issue is not failure. You are going to fail. The issue is your resilience in the face of failure. The question is not, are you going to fail or succeed? You have, almost every one of you here, you have succeeded like mad. You jumped through every hoop anybody has ever set in front of you, haven't you? You wouldn't be here if you were not a good hoop jumper. <laughs> I mean, your parents set hoops, and your teachers set hoops, and everybody else set hoops, and you jumped and jumped and jumped. But you know something? There's going to come a time when you can't jump through the hoop, or you jump and you don't get through, or you jump and you land on your nose, and you fail. And the question then is getting up. Can you just internalize this and remember this? This is important. The test is resilience. It's not success or failure. Uh, the other piece of this, and I mentioned your parents and hoops, and it reminded me, I want to say something about your parents. I don't know your parents. I'm not, I don't want to presume to say anything about your parents. <laughs> but I want to say something about your parents. <laughs> and that is that once you graduate, I want you to be respectful but I don't want you to feel you have to do anything they want you to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> because a, 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 lot of, a, a lot of the transition, I mean, you see the, tra the transition, uh, you all know this, the transition from home to college. Uh, college is sort of, in many people's minds, and sort of sociologically, it's a way station between home and the world out there. Uh, and some of you are going to find yourselves dependent, still dependent on your parents. It's going to be pretty humiliating, but you are. I mean, the job, the job market's not that great. Some of you have student debt. Some of you are going to have to live at home. Oh my God, can you imagine that humiliation? You will. And, but, but, uh, but, but, but here's the thing. Your parents no longer if they are, even now, no longer. Their opinions you want to listen to, but they can no longer control your life. You have to make up your own mind. Now, I say that as if that's a simple proposition. It's not. Particularly for good kids who always jump through the right hoops. 
and you would not be here unless you were not a good kid. <coughs> you didn't act out as a teenager. Oh yes, you did a little bit, but you wouldn't have got into Berkeley and you would not have succeeded if you were an acting out person. You are a good person. You try to be good. You try to do what other people want you to do. That's innate in your nature. And now, you've got to try to do what you want to do. Do you understand the difference? Am I making sense? I'm trying to read your faces. <laughs> All right. Now here, I want to expand the lens a little bit and talk about the society and the world. And I want to talk a little bit about leadership. Because there are some big things that you're going to have to, not you individually, directly, uh, but I think you are going to indirectly have to contend with. Uh, one of the big things, there are three big, big survival issues in terms of society and the world. Three. I mean, there are many more than three, but three big, big ones. One has to do with nuclear proliferation and nuclear fissile material falling into the wrong hands. And you're going to have to deal with that. I hope in a positive and constructive way, and I hope we all survive. The second has to do with, the second has to do with climate change. And we all are affected by that already. And we all have some degree of responsibility in terms of doing something that reduces the extraordinary cost and burden and environmental injustices. Right? When I say injustices, I mean that climate change is hurting most the people who are the poorest in every society. And it's going to continue to do that unless or until we, and by me, I mean me and you and all of us, take more responsibility. So that's number two. The third has to do with widening inequality of income and wealth and opportunity and power in this society and in most other societies. Now, I teach a course uh, called Wealth and Poverty, and I've done a lot of writing. The one thing that, 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 that I like to do, I love to write. I love to write books, but I have one of my sons said to me the other day, uh, actually it was more than that, uh, he, he said quite a while ago, he said, Dad, um, if you want to reach my generation, he's now uh, in his mid-twenties, he said, if you want to reach my generation, you cannot write books. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, Sam? I, I, I can't write books. He said, yeah. he said look, it, don't, be, don't be offended. Uh, it's just that my generation, we read, but we don't love to read. That is, we're not necessarily readers in the sense that you might think we are when you write books. Uh, if you really want to reach a lot of us, you might think about video or film or something that actually connects emotionally with the way that a lot of us think and feel. So on the basis of that, uh, I continue to write, and I'm still writing books, and I don't expect anybody to read them anymore. <laughs> uh, but I started also to do more film, and we experimented with video, and we've been really doing a lot of things. Uh, but the issue of widening inequality of income and wealth is something that I feel particularly passionate about. I think, it, I think the passion comes I'm not sure where it comes from. I, I used to think it came from my years as Secretary of Labor because I go around the country and I talk to a lot of people and I talk to uh, people who are suffering, who are barely making it. A lot of people who are working their bones off and are still very poor. And a lot of people who are scared. They're not just poor, they are frightened. 65% of Americans, the richest country in the world, 65% of us are living paycheck to paycheck. Just one paycheck away from poverty. And a lot of those people are either going to be either because they're fired or because they are getting sick or because of something else that they can't foresee, they actually are falling into poverty. The old gap between the middle class and the poor that we used to think was quite rigid is not rigid. It's porous. 
And so there's a great deal of fear and insecurity out there. And I saw it when I was Secretary of Labor, and I have seen it grow since then. It's not that it's vanished, it's actually growing. We are the richest country in the world. And yet, 15% of us are in poverty. 22% of American kids are in poverty. And that understates actually the extent of their need. When I say 22% are in poverty, what I'm saying is the official poverty line is drawn at three times what a family needs for food. It does not take in account of the rising costs of rent and housing and the rising costs of a lot of other things. For many families that are not quite Medicaid eligible, the rising costs of health care and so on. The rising costs of all sorts of things we take for granted that used to be part of our definition of a decent life is completely out of the possible zone of possibility for many of these families and then sleeping in their cars tonight because they don't have any homes. I talked to teachers in the Los Angeles School District not that long ago and the teacher, I was saying, well, what, what do you know? How are, the, how are the classes? And they told me that a lot of the students, they can't even track because the students are in one class and then three months later, they are in a different school because they are, they're actually moving in a car. They don't have a home. 24,000 in one city. The richest nation in the world. So the question is, whether it's nuclear proliferation, or climate change, or widening inequality, or any of a number of other issues. What are you going to do about it? I don't mean that you have a personal, direct responsibility to do anything about any of these. I just simply mean that they are going to affect your lives, and to the extent that you can, even to a small degree, change the direction that we are going in, modify it, improve it, you're going to affect the future. So how do you do that? What is leadership all about in terms of these huge problems? Well, to me, it has to do with overcoming four <coughs> things. Overcoming four work avoidance mechanisms deep in the heart of a lot of people. A lot of people, I mean you, you walk along the street, you see somebody who is very needy and poor and who has been sleeping on the street, and they say, do you have some spare change? And you, probably, if you're anything like me, you are torn. You want to give the person some spare change, you want to give the person, in fact, you'd like to give the person a lot of money if you possibly could, but at the same time, you think, oh, I don't know, I, 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 I don't know whether it's, I, I, <laughs> you know the feeling? Work avoidance. Work avoidance is the avoidance by people of getting together and solving a common problem. And the first work avoidance mechanism is denial. Denial that the problem exists. There are people who still want to deny climate change. There are people who still want to deny that there is widening inequality, that there is a lot of poverty. There are people that want to deny that we are living in a dangerous world and that we actually have to work with people around the world. There are people who want to deny the fundamental realities around us. So one of your jobs as a leader, even a mini leader, even a leader in your community or your friends or your circle is to overcome denial. Help people see the truth. Help people see reality. Help people understand what is really going on. I've said to some of you, I know, that the best way to learn is to talk to somebody who disagrees with you. Get out of your bubble. If you want to teach people how not to deny, get out of your bubble. I don't mean you should all move tomorrow to Oklahoma City. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but I do mean it is important. You know, sometimes I say uh, to students who are leaving Berkeley, I say, go forth and change the world. And they say back to me, but we want to stay in the Bay Area. <laughs> I understand that 
Grand Falls. And I love the Bay Area, and I have never been as happy as since I moved out here. I, I came out here in uh, 2006, but the first time I came, I'm going to get to the other three. You might, you might think this is a tangent, and it is. <laughs> But I just thought of it, and I want to I wanted share it with you. Because I came out to Berkeley, the first time I came out to Berkeley was 1968. And I was here almost accidentally. Again, luck. I, I, got a, I, was a, I was an art history major as an undergraduate. Anybody an art history major? <laughs> isn't it wonderful? Isn't it, isn't it fabulous sitting in those dark rooms watching those beautiful, beautiful pieces of art, having people talk to you about them? Isn't it great? I'm sorry, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> so I, I came and I wanted to, I, I, I was thinking of becoming an architect and I got through a friend of a friend, I got a job at Berkeley as a teaching assistant to a professor of architecture here at Berkeley. Uh, and, uh, and I came and I, and I drove my old, you know, beat up Beetle, you know, 1968, that's what we drove, beat up Beetles. Uh, and I got to University Avenue and I, and I heard about, I heard about Berkeley and I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to expect because I had been gone, I had been, I had been living in a monastery in Siberia called Dartmouth College. <laughs> And it was like that moment in, in, in The Wizard of Oz, you know, when, when Dorothy opens the door and it's all technicolor. <laughs> so I was driving up University Avenue and I got, I got the, the, first, the first smell of... <laughs> of this combination of eucalyptus uh, and, uh, and, and, and marijuana <laughs> and, and tear gas. I mean, it was... <laughs> the most intoxicating smell I've ever, I've ever, and I knew that I, I, I had arrived, I had arrived, I was home. This was my spiritual home. And then, and then I, you know, I didn't, of course, I didn't realize it so deeply that I stayed. I went off for the next 30 years. Stupid. Uh, but I love it here, and you love it here. Uh, but you need to get out of the bubble, you need to talk to others, and you need to make sure that they understand reality. And if your reality is wrong, test your reality, but get out of, and help others get out of denial. That's number one. The second mechanism that is kind of a work avoidance mechanism, when I say work avoidance, I mean doing, avoiding the hard work of dealing with a real concrete set of social problems. The second work avoidance mechanism is escapism. And what do I mean by escapism? I simply mean that a lot of people say, well, I recognize there's a problem. There's a problem with poverty. Uh, there's a problem with, with, uh, with global warming. There's a problem with, uh, with nuclear with proliferation. There's a problem in, uh, I, yeah, there are a lot of problems. But you know, frankly, I don't have to worry about it because I'm going to be fine and my children are going to be fine. And I, you know, I, I'd like to worry about it, but I, I'm escaping from it. I can escape from it. I can live. In a, in a gated community, or I can live in a nice place, and I can get a good job, and I can, I can escape. Of course, the reality is there is no escape. I mean, climate change, there is really no escape. It, it, it is going to hit the poor first, it is hitting the poor first, but ultimately, there is no escape. And there's no escape from any of the other perils. Escapism is a myth. But you've got to help others overcome and in yourself overcome escapism in order to get on with what has to be done. The third avoidance mechanism, work avoidance mechanism, that you can see everywhere around you is scapegoating. And what do I mean by scapegoating? People say, oh yes, I know that there is a problem. I, I know that it cannot be, I can't escape from it. But you know what the problem is? Because of them. It's the poor. It's immigrants. It's the rich. It's government. It's corporations. Whatever. Be suspicious of easy explanations that are really parts of scapegoating. Blaming. 
the politics of blame, the politics of resentment. That's what we are experiencing right now. You know, I was in and out of Washington over the past 30 years. I have never seen so much polarization that is built around the politics of blame. As long as we are in scapegoating modality, nothing is going to be accomplished. Nothing is going to be done. So you've got to help people around you avoid scapegoating. I was on a television show not long ago. I was debating somebody who had been the chief policy advisor to John McCain in the 2008 election. And it turned out that he and I, we were talking about various economic issues, and he and I, turned out, agreed more than we disagreed. And it came to a station break, a commercial break, and the producer in my earbud said, be angrier. <laughs> I said, well, wait a minute, I thought you were going to like what, I mean, we, we've actually, we are, we are modeling for the public what nobody else is modeling. That is, we're showing the Democrats, Republicans, people on the left, people on the right, actually can agree and that we can find common ground. Isn't that good? And she said, no. I said, why? She said, because people who are watching have a choice. They are, they, they are surfing through hundreds of channels. And they stop when they find a kind of mud wrestling gladiator contest the way they stop when they feel when they stop when people are angry we know that i said but i don't want to be angry she said you have to be angry we have five seconds left before we go back on and i at that moment i lost my temper <laughs> but scapegoating and the politics of blame are what needs to be overcome they are a work avoidance mechanism. And finally, the most insidious work avoidance mechanism of all, the one that is going to take the hardest work on your part to help yourself and others overcome, is cynicism. When I say cynicism, I mean the attitude that nothing can be done. Nothing can be done because our institutions are so rotten, our democracy is so corrupt, people are so indifferent. In fact, we shouldn't even try because it's going to be a waste of time to try and we're going to end up feeling worse. Cynicism is the gravest enemy of all. And if any of you feel yourself falling prey to cynicism at the age of 21, 22, 23, 24, please, please, stop whatever you're doing. Take a long walk. Tell yourself that that is the most insidious work avoidance mechanism of all. Because if you look through American history, just to take American history, you see time and time again, uh, time and time again, people getting together and changing things. I mean, look, even in your brief lifetime so far, look at what has happened with regard to equal marriage rights. Nobody, nobody assumed that was possible. But what has happened over the last 20 years? There has been a quiet movement and a very effective movement. And we find just like equal marriage rights, smoking has dropped off of almost everybody. I mean, there is still too much smoking, but in terms of what the public is doing about smoking and what we are doing collectively to change our habits, we're doing a lot. And go back in time. In my era, in terms of my lifetime, the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam movement, I mean, these are huge successes. Don't ever tell me that cynicism is merited. It is never merited. People who are cynics don't know history. People who are cynics don't even know what's going on around them. When people get together, 
and generate the force and power of their collective convictions, change is hugely not only possible, but likely. Not immediately, it takes time. When 12 people got together in 1791 to end the British slave trade, 12 people, they got together in London in a library to end the British slave trade. Nobody thought it was possible. The entire British economy depended on the slave trade. But what happened? Over the next 20 years, these 12 people turned their indignation, their outrage, their moral sensibility into a movement that ended the British slave trade. So cynicism has no place in a decent society. One more point that I want to suggest to you, and that is every one of you has what I call a personality drug. Now, what do I mean by a personality drug? I mean something that you get and want, but is insatiable. Your love and want and need for it never ends. You cannot get enough. Some of you have a personality drug that is, you want to be loved. Or you like other people to just like you. Uh, some of you have a personality drug, you want to control things. You want to be in control. Some of you have a personality drug, you, you want and need money. Some of you have a personality drug, well you know what I'm talking about. The way you, the way you recognize your personality drug is actually two ways. Number one, it's insatiable. No matter how much you get, you want more. And number two, it keeps on tripping you up. You keep on making mistakes or getting into trouble because of your personality drug. Every one of you, I think, has one. You may not, or maybe more than one. Maybe you have three. <laughs> maybe you have five, but... Here's what you can do, and this is what it's, why this is connected to leadership and your careers and everything else. Because one option that I do not recommend is spending $100,000 on psychotherapy. <laughs> it's too expensive. What I do recommend is that you at least develop, if you haven't already, the self-awareness that is required to understand what your personality drug actually is. And then, once you know it, Be aware of when you're getting close to it taking over or distorting your judgment or making you act out in ways that are destructive. That's all I'm suggesting. Because if you are going to exercise the kind of leadership that I'm recommending that you exercise in terms of helping others overcome their work avoidance mechanisms, and face common threats, big and small, you've got to be aware of your own capacity. Most of all, though, my wish for you is that you find the capacity for real joy in what you do. I don't mean necessarily passion. I don't mean that every day is going to be exciting. There are going to be days when you actually have to scrape dog shit off of our roof. <laughs> or the equivalent, the moral equivalent. I simply mean that I want for you what I have had the privilege of having in most of my life, and that is a joyful experience in the work I do. Nothing could be a greater gift for you. Thank you all, and God bless you, and good luck.
According to our social contract, <laughs> we have about 10 minutes uh, for your questions. And I would like to uh, be able to answer any question you have. Yes. And I'll repeat the, I'll repeat the question. If you could give advice um, to yourself when you were about to graduate from college, um, what would you tell yourself and why? I, if I could give my advice, my self-advice, when I was about to graduate from college, uh, what would I tell myself and why? Uh, well, I'd say, first of all, don't pay any attention to any, but anything anybody says who's over 60 years old. <laughs> As a general rule of thumb. Um, I would also tell myself uh, just about everything I've told you tonight. Um, I'd also, uh, knowing me and knowing my personality drugs, I would probably say, don't burn yourself out. Because you're going to do no one any good if you burn out. Uh, just try to pace yourself. And don't try to excel and exceed everywhere, every time, and get everything perfect. Am I talking to some of you? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. How would you restore faith in someone who has followed the criticism? I'm sorry, say it again. How would you restore faith in someone who has followed the criticism? How would I restore faith in somebody who has followed the criticism? Oh, fallen into cynicism. Well, I think the, the best way of, of restoring, uh, as you say, faith, but actually overcoming cynicism, uh, is to show uh, people. Uh, that there are successes, that there are ways in which, in fact, Martin Luther King, I mean, remember, Martin Luther King is dealing with an enormous number of people who have been beaten down and beaten down and beaten down and beaten down and beaten down. I mean, this is a group of mostly Southern African Americans who have no sense of possibility. They are deeply resigned to where they are. And so how does Martin Luther King ignite a sense of possibility and overcome that deeply ingrained centuries of cynicism and resignation? Well, what he does is he looks for small victories. And he looks for the small victories that give people a sense of efficacy. One of the biggest problems we have in America right now is that so many people feel powerless. They feel like they cannot do anything and be effective. And so leadership in terms of overcoming cynicism is about giving people a sense of agency and efficacy. Even at the smallest degree, you have no idea what that will do. Uh, when you didn't make it through the hurdle, and uh, how you were able to get back up, like an example. Well, uh, the question is, uh, a time I did not make it through the hurdle and how I was able to get back up. Uh, well, uh, for one thing, I, I wanted to play very badly professional basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about not making it through the hoop. <laughs> No, I, I think that uh, it's a good question, and I think that in my own life I, I found it very difficult because I, like many of you, uh, have always was able to jump through the hoop. And, and the first time uh, in my career, pretty early on, uh, when I screwed up, I felt devastated. I mean, far be out of proportion to the actual failure. I mean, the devastation because it shook my confidence in my capacity to succeed. I had never failed before in a, in a big way, but and I was out in the real world. And so I had to do a lot of talking to myself. I had to do, and, and if you have good friends, and at that time I had a circle of friends, but I was in another city, and I left them by, you know, if I had good friends, and I've used good friends, and use your good friends uh, to sound this stuff, to talk this stuff through. Because when you do, they will help you see it's not a gigantic, humongous failure. It is, you know, you screwed up. And maybe you even screwed up to the extent that you lost a job. Sounds pretty awful. But 
A lot of people lose their jobs. And a lot of people are losing their jobs for no fault at all. So it's a matter of perspective. Yes, sir. What is your personality drug? <laughs> I'm not telling you. No, I think my personality drug, as I suggested here, is, is a tendency to work too hard and to be a little bit too much of a perfectionist and be too impatient with myself. And that's, and, but I, I know it now. So I'm now very relaxed. <laughs> yes, in the back. Did you say love or work? I'm sorry? Love or work? Love or work? You mean which would I prefer? <laughs> which do I prioritize? What do I prioritize? Love or work? Well, for, uh, Freud, uh, <laughs> no, I mean it. Freud said that there were, those were the two most important things in one's life, in, in love and work. I think he said it in German, <laughs> right? Uh, and, uh, and in terms of, and in terms of, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a never ending, never ending tension. Don't think that there is a magic balance. You know, I was, when I was Secretary of Labor, I was working 18 hours a day, every day, and sometimes taking one day off on a weekend, but very often I had to go to the White House for meetings. I had two small kids who were pre-teens. I had a wife who was very tolerant, but she was not seeing anything of me, and I was seeing nothing of my kids. And I was deeply torn because here is the most important job I knew I would ever have. I was affecting the lives of millions of people. I was working on trying to raise the minimum wage and trying to get the Family and Medical Leave Act enacted and trying to do half a dozen other things with, with, with regard to workplace safety. And here I had my family. And how in the world was I going to balance my family against all of that? And finally, at the end of four and a half years, I knew, even though Bill Clinton wanted me to stay, I knew that if I stayed in that job, I would see nothing of, of my boys before they graduated high school. And then, that would be it. And so I told Bill Clinton that I'm going home. Not because balance was impossible, but because I couldn't get enough of both my family and the job. It was the best job I ever had, but it was the best family I ever had. <laughs> and so sometimes the balance requires sequencing. Sometimes you've got to take time for the family, and that has got to be, or your love, and that's got to be the first priority. And sometimes uh, it cannot be. Sometimes it's got to go in the other direction. I think one of the biggest, and here let me, let me say something that will be perhaps meaningful to you. If men wanted to have children as much as women, men would be doing more of the work of child rearing. <laughs> and maybe we will get to that point, and I hope we do. But what I want you all to be aware of, you young women and young men, is that it is very important for men to take, if you possibly can, as much responsibility in bringing up the kids as the women do. <laughs> and we have time for just about, yes. My, my advice in navigating and facilitating um, the propagation or whatever you have to advise on terms of these like rising trends and people jumping on and off camera. Oh, I say in terms of trends. Yes. In other words, in other words, you're saying uh, when there is a trend, an economic trend, or a a, 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 a kind of trendy idea, yeah, or a trendy a trend. You know, how do you how do you differentiate between something that is just a a, a fashion? 
uh, that is just, uh, just a superficial fashion uh, from something that is very fundamental. Well, I, I'd say that the only reasonable test is whether something grips you personally in a very, in a very profound way. Uh, whether it's, again, whether it's a fashion or it's an idea or it's a movement, uh, if you feel that it makes a great deal of sense and it makes, it stirs something in you, I think that's a pretty good indication given that you are reasonably mature, now that's a huge given right there, <laughs> but I think that's a pretty good indication that it may be not just a passing fad or fashion, but it may be more profound than that. Uh, but you're going to make errors, and sometimes you're going to glom onto something that really is just superficial and, and sudden and passing, and that's okay. That really is okay. One more question. Yes. Uh, it sounds like you had a fulfilling life. I'm wondering what your... <laughs> okay. Uh, it sounds like I had a fulfilling life. It was great. It really was great. And what are my remaining goals for the... Next couple of years that I am. <laughs> well, I'd like to be president of the United States. <laughs> books that I want to write. <laughs> I think it would be nice to, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, take over Steve Colbert's role. <laughs> uh, I, I think of those, of those goals, uh, the only one that's reasonable is the second. I mean, the only one that I'm probably going to achieve is the books. Uh, but uh, I don't, you know, I, I have never actually, and I suppose, probably should have, uh, and this is a good way to end, I suppose. Uh, you know, if you try to be too strategic about your life, uh, you are going to blow it. Because you can be too strategic, A, because you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know enough about you, you don't know about, enough about luck, uh, you don't know uh, enough about opportunities, and it would be absurd to think that you could plan. And I'm not suggesting being passive. Uh, I, I suggest, uh, and, you know, be as, as, as a, alert and, and as aggressive and as opportunistic as you possibly can, but don't for a minute, believe that you're going to be able to plan this out. A lot of things are going to happen that you cannot expect. Opportunities are going to come along that you will never imagine. You are going to find things out about yourself and about the world that are going to blow your mind. I hope in positive ways. And so don't over plan. Please. But have fun while you're at it. Thank you.